So welcome everybody. I am so happy that you are joining us this evening for a talk with Dr. Addy Benito about insulin resistance, what it is, why it matters. And of course we talk about the food. So for those of you who are, have not met Dr. Benito before, uh, Dr. Addy Benito is passionate about educating her patients and giving them practical tools to improve their well-being. She's board certified in endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism attended the medical school in Spain and completed a residency at, in internal medicine at Pennsylvania Hospital, the University of Pennsylvania Health System. She completed a fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes and metabolism at the University of Pennsylvania and completed a two-year fellowship at the University of Arizona Center of Excellence in Integrative Medicine, where she is a guest, she is guest faculty. She studied herbal medicine at the David Winston Center for Herbal Studies, and she is a certified meditation teacher. There are not many people, doctors, medical doctors, practitioners who have this wealth of various um, expertise and knowledge. And we are really privileged to have her as our chief medical advisor. And she um, reviews and advises everything that we do, which means that everything that you're getting is, um, is, is really uh, been reviewed and approved by her. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Benita, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, we're talking about insulin resistance, what it is and why it matters. So to begin, um, a bit of scope of what we're dealing with. Four in 10 adults in the US have insulin resistance. Um, this is from a study, a population study in the U.S. 50% uh, were not obese. We sometimes make a correlation between obesity and insulin resistance, and this was an interesting finding. Um, and what we know about insulin resistance is that it precedes type 2 diabetes. So it comes before type 2 diabetes by about 10 to 15 years. So we can do something to prevent diabetes if we catch this on time. We know that chronic diseases, what we call non-communicable diseases are on the rise. And those um, involve diabetes mellitus, type two diabetes, more than 30 million Americans are affected by type two diabetes. Um, 88 million Americans have pre-diabetes, which again is a precursor to diabetes. 84% of them do not know it. Cardiovascular disease, obesity, dementia, a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease affects about 100 million Americans and it's gonna uh, supersede uh, hepatitis C as the most likely cause of liver failure and uh, liver transplant in the future and cancer. And what these conditions have in common is that they all have insulin resistance at the core of them. So what is insulin resistance? We think of insulin um, as a hormone, it is a hormone, and we think that to be the key that allows cells to get insulin, excuse me, get glucose into them. So insulin, when we eat food, we secrete this hormone called insulin through or via the, the pancreas. Insulin is supposed to again allow glucose into the cells, but if our cells cannot see that insulin, do not uh, respond to it, then glucose stays up in the blood when insulin and glucose get together, that stores glucose as fat. So because this, the sugar or the glucose cannot get into the cells, we become tired, we become hungry, and we gain a little bit of weight. And then when we eat food, the same thing happens again. Until our pancreas gets a little bit tired because it's trying to compensate. It's trying to make more insulin to compensate for our cells not seeing that insulin. And over time, the pancreas get tired and doesn't produce enough insulin and we develop diabetes. Now, this is a very um, simplified view of what insulin resistance is and how insulin resistance contributes to diabetes. There is more, more to diabetes, to type two diabetes than insulin resistance, uh, but it's one part of it. So why does it matter? Um, it matters because at the core, insulin resistance, when you have high levels of insulin created by that insulin resistance, that causes inflammation. So you have this chronic inflammatory state. High levels of insulin lead to weight gain. Weight gain creates more inflammation and that disrupts our metabolic processes. We know that insulin resistance can lead to diabetes and obesity. It can lead to uh, heart attacks, high blood pressure. It can lead to decreased blood flow in the brain. So that creates cognitive decline as well as dementia. 
when insulin um, picks up glucose, it deposits glucose as fat in the liver. So something called triglycerides, they go into the liver and they create something called fatty liver. Um, we know that the uh, cholesterol fractions get imbalanced when we have insulin resistance and our fat metabolism becomes altered. In women, too much insulin also leads to higher levels of testosterone and that can worsen a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. So uh, there are other um, situations that can lead to insulin resistance, but how do you know if you can, if you have it? So um, these are the symptoms and signs of insulin resistance. One that we as clinicians look for is something called acanthosis nigricans, which is a darkening and a velvety appearance of the skin. And you can see that under um, the armpits, you can see that on the neck, either the side or the back. So it's darker and if you touch it, it has a velvet uh, feel to it. Um, not every appearance like this is insulin resistance. All right, there are other conditions that can mimic it, um, these acanthosis nigricans, but it is something that we look um, to see, we can find it in our patients. Insulin resistance, again, because the glucose doesn't get into your cells, can lead to fatigue and increased hunger. It can lead to weight gain. Insulin is a growth hormone. It makes it more difficult to lose weight. Um, the things that you can see on an examination are high blood pressure. And if you have blood work, you'll see low HDL, H for healthy. So the healthy cholesterol is low. You see high fasting glucose and fasting triglyceride levels. When you have this combination, weight gain, high blood pressure, low HDL, high glucose, high triglycerides, that we call insulin resistance syndrome or metabolic syndrome. And again, that's a precursor to um, prediabetes and diabetes. So we've talked about what insulin resistance can do in our bodies. We're going to talk a bit about what are the causes of insulin resistance. So the classical causes are obesity, inactivity, genetics, aging, anytime we're over the age of 45, that puts us at risk for insulin resistance. Um, and some medications and other medical conditions can lead to insulin resistance as well. In addition to these causes, there are some others. Inadequate sleep. So actually sleeping too little, less than six hours or sleeping too much, more than nine hours can lead to insulin resistance. The stress. And that's in part because when we are under stress, that triggers a hormone called cortisol, but also triggers another hormone called adrenaline. So your fight or flight. And those two hormones actually lead to insulin resistance. Ultra processed foods, we'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. Environmental disrupting chemicals. These chemicals in the environment that affect our hormones that either mimic hormones or works against our hormones. There are two kinds that can lead to insulin resistance, what we call obesogens and the diabetogens. Being sedentary, again, the lack of physical activity and the gut microbiome is something we're starting to pay some attention to in terms of insulin resistance. I'm gonna talk a bit about these um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, the EDCs that act as obesogens that lead to weight gain. These chemicals promote obesity, so make you gain weight via different mechanisms. Some of them do it because they increase the, um, the size of the fat cells. Some others increase the amount of fat cells you have in your body. They will alter your metabolism. They interfere with appetite and satiety. Some of the examples of these obesogens are DDT, which although banned in this country, we still are exposed to, sometimes through water. PFOA. Um, is, uh, you can find that in the coating of this nonstick cookware. PFAS, um, sort of a cousin of PFOA. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about them as well as phthalates because this we actually find in some of the uh, foods we eat. This is um, a quote from the uh, second um, summary statement by the Endocrine Society on endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they very strongly um, say that endocrine disrupting chemicals are, um, are really leading to these chronic diseases that we see today, including uh, diabetes. So I don't know if you um, all read the Washington Post article yesterday, uh, where they actually talk about food processing and how that can lead to weight gain and the problems with ultra processing. So um, some researchers have 
categorize processing of foods into these four groups. So group one is your fresh or minimally processed foods, so your apple. Group two is your processed culinary ingredients. So the salt, the honey, the oils, the eggs. So applesauce. Group three are your processed foods. So the combination of a group one and a group two. So applesauce that you find at the grocery store, not the one you made. Or cheese or milk or bread, right? So you're using a little bit of the grains and a little bit of you know eggs, and then you're making this. And then group four is the ultra processed foods. And those are the ones that you cannot recognize as food. So this little whatever apple things are here that is not really an apple or applesauce, right? That's the ultra processed foods. Um, interestingly, in this article, the Washington Post said that in the United States, ultra processed foods make 58% of the calories we consume. They also quote this study, which, um, Anyway, long story, I will not go into that. Um, but this researcher um, had people go into this ultra processed food diet and um, fresh food diet. And then people swapped and do the opposite. And what they observed was that when the people when people ate ultra processed foods, they gained weight. They actually end up ended up eating over 500 calories more when they were eating ultra processed foods uh, than when they were on the fresh uh, food diet. So just interesting observations about food processing. There's more to food processing, and that is this endocrine disrupting chemicals that I was talking about before. So researchers have found that levels of something called phthalates, these toxic chemicals, when one of these endocrine disrupting chemicals are 35% higher in those who regularly eat at restaurants, cafeterias, and fast food places, but also when people eat ultra processed foods. Phthalates have been linked to health problems, including infertility, asthma, as well as obesity. And we know that obesity then leads to insulin resistance. There are also chemicals that are used in the fast food wrappers. And these are these PFAS that we're talking about before, the ones that are, you know, sort of the cousins of the uh, coated um, Teflon pens. And those may be associated with weight gain. And then Another chemical, this bisphenol A, which has been in the news uh, for a few years now, which you can find in plastics as well as in cans, um, also in the thermal receipts that you get from the grocery store, um, those have been associated with insulin resistance directly. When researchers have tried to understand what can we eat that will make us be less likely to get these phthalates and BPA in our, in our food, um, what they summarized was that if you ate foods and had dietary patterns that were associated with either organic, grown, raised, or caught foods with folic acid supplements, if you were vegetarian, all that was associated with lower phthalate and lower BPAs in our urine. So just switching what we eat, um, you know, eating, I think just eating more vegetables um, can be beneficial. I want to talk a bit about the gut microbiome. Um, so we know that the gut microbiome, this intestinal microbiota, has a role in um, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. And part of that is because when we have bacterial dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of the gut flora, that links to, again, metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So this gut microbiome seems to be important to maintain that metabolic health. We know that probiotics, the good bacteria, they lower inflammation and they have this anti-diabetic and anti-obesity effect. And that has been seen, especially with fermented yogurt. The combination of a prebiotic, so what is, um, as my herbal teacher, David Wilson used to say, the miracle grow for the gut flora. So your prebiotics have all your fiber foods. When you combine prebiotics with a probiotic, that's called symbiotic. And that lowers inflammation and also improves liver parameters in people with fatty liver. Interestingly, there have been studies, these are in mice, not in humans, um, but studies done with emulsifiers. And in particular, these two, something called carboxymethyl cellulose and the other one called polysorbate 80. And those two have been associated with metabolic syndrome as well as with gut inflammation in mice. Um, again, no data in humans, but I would be hard pressed to say there's not going to be an association in humans with these emulsifiers. This is the other name for these emulsifiers, cellulose gum, sodium salt. 
called service 80. We also call it twin 80. Um, you can find them in food, mostly processed foods, anything that uh, needs something to be fluffy, like sauces, puddings, um, ice creams, um, cottage cheese, salad dressings, even whipped cream, right? So just look for those and try to avoid them if you can. So how do we treat insulin resistance? What do we do? So I think the first thing we need to know is what's a risk? What's your risk for insulin resistance? So I know mine. Um, do you have a family history of diabetes? I do. Do you, were you a baby that was large at birth? Were you over nine pounds? Um, that puts you at risk for diabetes and insulin resistance. Do you have this acanthosis nigricans, this dark velvety um, skin over the back of the neck or your armpits or even um, the thighs? Um, are you over 45 years of age? Are you from an ethnic group that has a higher risk? So again, Hispanics, Asian um, Island, Pacific Islanders, um, African-Americans, all at higher risk. So once you know your risk, um, or perhaps you've done a blood test and your blood test shows you have high triglycerides, high glucose when you're fasting and you have a low HDL. And you've noticed that you put a few pounds and they're around your waist. That should be very suspicious for insulin resistance. So once you know that, how do we reduce that uh, insulin resistance? What do we do about it? So we're gonna talk a bit about eating styles, uh, food stops, food preparation, fasting. That's gonna be the most of what I'm gonna talk next. And then I'll talk a little bit about exercise, sleep, de-stressing and botanicals and supplement, just to mention them. So how about food? What sort of diet could we um, adhere to or, or maybe some of our dishes could have that type of diet that could be helpful? So Mediterranean diets have been thought to be beneficial to lower insulin resistance. And that's because they're rich in vegetables, fruits, olive oil, and fish, and all those things um, lower insulin resistance. DASH diet is the, um, the diet against um, um, hypertension. The dietary approach is to stop hypertension, um, right? So that also has a lot of vegetables. Um, they actually put some dairy into that diet as well. I didn't put their vegetarian diets, but those should also be included in this list. Um, anything that increases vegetables is going to lower insulin resistance. We'll talk a bit about intermittent fasting and I put a question mark because that is a little bit mixed into whether it's beneficial. Some studies say yes, some studies might not see so much of a benefit. We know that if you have enough protein, that is also beneficial. When people have low protein, that actually leads to insulin resistance. I'm not saying you eat a steak with every meal. That's too much protein and that actually can be also detrimental. You have to keep it somewhere in the middle. If you have a high intake of fiber, and food dairy products have also been seen as protectors from insulin resistance. Now, if you have a dairy allergy, if you have any issues, I'm not asking you to eat full fat dairy, but we can all increase fiber in our diets. That's something we can all do and we should do. And of course, avoidance foods that we call high glycemic. So these are foods that break down into glucose very quickly. So anything that has, you know, like white bread or any, any flour that um, it's uh, pulverized, right? Any grain that is pulverized is a high glycemic uh, food. We have talked a bit about these endocrine disrupting chemicals, and this is what you can do to try to avoid them or to minimize them. So of course you can try to avoid these ultra processed foods and fast food in your life. Um, I'm not saying you eliminate them, you definitely try to avoid them as, as best you can. Prepare meals at home, emphasize fresh ingredients. That's also beneficial. If you're concerned about chemicals in water, you can consider using a water filter. I think there is a talk coming up soon with Ailey Cohen, and she's, she'll be talking, I'm sure, about all these endocrine disrupting chemicals and how to protect your home and your environment from, from those. Um, so you'll get more information on that talk if you're interested. You can also avoid plastic utensils and anything that has these numbers. If you can, there are alternatives to plastics that you can use. Also avoid using that non-stick cookware because of those PFOAs. Eat a diversified diet with plenty of variety, especially with vegetables. In studies, if you eat a lot of veggies, that actually is gonna counteract the effect of this endocrine disrupting chemical. So that's really, really important. Avoid canned foods and beverages unless you know that those really don't contain any of the BPAs or phthalates. Um, you can actually go to this uh, website, the Environmental Working Group, which you can actually get information on canned foods that will not have BPA or phthalates. 
um, and you, they can also help you if you cannot eat organic all the time. They always publish what they call the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. The clean 15 are those foods that don't have as many pesticides or some of these pesticides end up being endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, so that could be another um, resource. And if you can't, then wash your fruits and vegetables for over a minute. You want to scrub them and you want to allow them to soak just with soap and water or a bit of vinegar. That's all you need. So I mentioned fasting and uh, in particular, the, what we call time-restricted feeding, it's what has been linked to improve uh, glucose and insulin levels. So time-restricted feeding means that you eat all your meals within six to 10 hours. Even eating within those 10 hours versus 14 is going to improve some parameters that have then been linked to insulin resistance. Eating within six hours versus 12 improves weight, insulin, blood pressure, and appetite. If you eat here between 8 to 2 p.m., that's better than if you eat after 4 p.m. That's not very easy to do. Um, and if you eat again in the middle of the day, that after 4 p.m. in some studies leads to more weight loss. Um, excuse me, when you eat early in the day, it leads to more weight loss, better sugar control, and lower inflammation. So this is what you see here. So eating here, instead of eating all throughout the day, those 12 hours, leads to an increase in insulin sensitivity. So lower insulin resistance. Um, and that's what we're aiming. And again, not all the studies are uh, beneficial. What to me is really important is that if you decide to do time-restricted feeding, that you don't starve yourself. So I'm not saying that time restricted to feeding or it shouldn't be construed as equi being equal to skipping meals. You're not skipping meals. You're eating all your meals in a shorter amount of time. So eating just one meal a day, that's to my mind, not time restricted feeding, that's a starvation. And I don't think anybody should be doing that. So we're gonna talk about what foods can decrease insulin resistance. And if you decide to take a look at my talk on inflammation, you'll see a lot of the same foods because what lowers inflammation lowers insulin resistance and what lowers insulin resistance lowers inflammation. So fiber, um, especially fiber that we call fermentable or soluble, we wanna aim for about 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day, 25 if you're a woman, 30 if you're a man or a woman who is trying to lose weight. Only about 5% of Americans get to that amount of fiber. Most of us get about 12 grams of fiber per day. There are other foods that are also important to lower insulin resistance, magnesium, polyphenols, and omega-3 fatty acids, and we'll talk about them a little bit. So this is where you can find this type of fiber called fermentable or soluble. And of course, not every food has just one kind of fiber. Most foods have a bit of combination of fermentable, soluble and soluble fiber, uh, but these are the ones that have uh, fermentable fiber and how much fiber they have per either cup or uh, piece. Avocados definitely uh, you know, pack a punch in terms of uh, fiber, they have 12 grams. So if you're a woman, you get already half of your uh, necessary amount with one avocado a day, and then it's a bit easier to get the rest in. Magnesium, magnesium is important um, for over 300 metabolic reactions in our body. Um, we know that magnesium lowers inflammation um, and insulin resistance, diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and colorectal cancer all have been associated with lower magnesium. So when you get magnesium through food, that's been associated with lowered inflammation and lowered insulin resistance, better blood pressure, better glucose. How do you get magnesium? For women, we want to aim for 320, men 420. These are recommendations by the Institute of Medicine. This is where you find magnesium, and that's how much magnesium you get in those foods. And what you can see just um, at first sight is that you need more than one of those foods to really get to your 320, you're a woman, or 420, you're a man. Just eating a cup of char is not going to do it. You're going to have to have a cup of char and maybe some black beans and maybe a little bit of dark chocolate. Why not? Um, so it's, it's not easy. And most Americans are actually deficient in magnesium. So you'll ask, what about supplements? 
Um, so it's not clear if magnesium supplements offer the same benefits. I found a study where they actually use magnesium uh, sulfate, which I don't think I've ever used in my entire life, but that's what the study had um, done. What I'll say is dietary magnesium is safe. You can eat as much chart and as much quinoa as you wish. You're not going to overdose on magnesium. But if you have kidney disease or you have any gut problems, you should not supplement with magnesium. You should be very cautious in supplementing magnesium. So always do that with the help of a health professional. Polyphenols um, is another foodstuff that leads to decreased insulin resistance. And that's because we know that diets that have the highest amount of polyphenols lower inflammation, lower insulin resistance, also improve fatty liver, which if you remember is one of those conditions that has insulin resistance at the core. Whether you eat four portions versus one makes a difference. And that's because polyphenols get quickly eliminated. And that means that you cannot just think, okay, well, I'm going to have blueberries today. And then maybe next Monday I'll have blueberries again. Well, no, not going to work that way. I'm being silly, but you know, you understand what I mean. Omega-3 fatty acids. Um, we know that they are linked to a healthier gut bacteria. Uh, they're anti-inflammatory. They also increase something called adiponectin. And adiponectin lowers insulin resistance and increases insulin sensitivity. So you can get um, omega-3 uh, through cold water fish or seafood, but you can also get it through seeds and nuts, grass-fed meats, eggs, especially when they're pastured. Um, and you can get them through spinach, Brussels sprouts, and soybeans. So there are many ways to get omega-3 fatty acids. This table gives you the amount of um, DHA, EPA, and ALA, the different kinds of omega-3s in food. I cannot tell you what dose or what amount you need to consume to decrease insulin resistance. That, to my knowledge, has not been um, evaluated. Um, but I would say not unreasonable to try to have something that has omega-3s every day. Um, and you can vary what that might be, right? Exercise. We know that any amount of physical activity is going to be beneficial for muscle. And muscle is one of the areas where our bodies actually become insulin resistant. So if we exercise, if we keep active, so just actually getting out of your chair, if you have a sedentary job and moving lowers insulin resistance, um, whether cardio versus resistance training is better is still sort of, I think, debated. We think that probably the combination of the two is better than just one of them. And in the core, what they're going to do is that they're going to improve insulin sensitivity and they're going to decrease the metabolic syndrome. There was one interesting study where they took uh, men and women who had no diabetes and they were trying to determine if they exercise early in the morning, middle of the day, or late in the evening, will that insulin resistance get better at any one of those times? And when they found us, as the day went by, when people actually exercise in the evening, they have lower insulin resistance. This is measured with something called HOMA um, IR, so homeostatic uh, model assessment of insulin resistance is one of the tools we use as clinicians to determine somebody has insulin resistance has some faults, but we do use it. One is supposed to be a good level of insulin sensitivity. Above that is bad. You want it below that. So again, evening gave people a lower amount of um, insulin resistance. It wasn't clear or it wasn't shown that insulin, um, excuse me, that exercising in the evening was better for fatty liver, uh, but it definitely lowered insulin resistance. How about stress reduction? We talked a little bit about that or we mentioned it. So there, are, have been, there have been some studies, one on what we call transcendental meditation, that after 16 weeks, uh, lower insulin resistance and blood pressure. There have been two studies, two small studies on yoga, also showing that it lowers insulin resistance. We, to my knowledge, we don't have data on acupuncture or uh, qigong, but I wouldn't be surprised if they are beneficial as well. Anything that lowers stress, right? Any of these stress reduction techniques um, should be beneficial. There are some botanicals and supplements that um, can be used for insulin resistance. Many of them are what we use in food. So they're polyphenols. They are either cinnamon or turmeric, green tea. Some of them are minerals like magnesium or calcium, which also has data for a lower in insulin resistance. Some are vitamins, vitamin D, vitamin K2, both of them also with data on insulin, on lowering insulin resistance. Pre and probiotics, we talked about them. You could definitely get them in a pill. I cannot tell you which one you would buy. We don't really have enough data to say this kind of 
lactobacilli or this kind of bifido is going to do X, Y, Z. Um, we just know that getting a healthier gut microbiome modifies insulin um, sensitivity. Omega-3 fatty acids, clearly you can take them as a supplement in fish oil or the non-fish uh, oil omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and then there are other supplements that are um, uh, sort of extracts from plants. One of them is berberine, which is an alkaloid uh, taken from golden seal, bayberry, barberry, or Chinese coptis. Um, works similar to metformin, which you might have heard is a medication used for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. Um, and uh, milk thistle is, um, or silymarin, well, silymarin is the, uh, what we think is the main um, ingredient or the, um, um, the active ingredient in milk thistle. Um, also being used for um, um, insulin resistance, especially situations of fatty liver. Milk this is estrogenic, so just something you have to be aware of. Um, I think if you're going to go into uh, supplements beyond food, you definitely should work with a practitioner so they can guide you as to whether those are appropriate for you and what doses you would use. I think food is always safe, um, and that I think will be the first step in trying to decrease insulin resistance, as well as, you know, insulin that you have good sleep and you're doing something to decrease um, stress. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you. There's always so many things that I did not know when you, when you share all this information with us. We do have a few mm -hmm. questions in the chat. Um, everybody, please feel free to um, either you can ask, you know, just you can unmute yourselves and ask, but I'll start with the questions that we have. Again, thank you so much. Um, really, the the um, information about the discoloration of the skin, mm -hmm. like, like I you, I see that, I, and yeah. I never you know never really connected yeah. that with anything. Yeah. Um, so people asked about nonstick pans, and um, we did our latest blog post has a lot of information about cookware. Um, so, you know, it really is reading those labels, right? So a lot there, I, I put that link in the chat. Um, somebody was asking about the, your best egg choices. And I, I tend to look for the, um, uh, certified humane. I mean, I stand in front of the eggs and I'm like, I have, you know, my, my whole like moral dilemma, you know? <laughs> But do you have any? Yeah, I think that probably pasture, you get a little bit more, um, you know, there's there's some um, uh, data on eggs as well as uh, milk. If you're going to have maybe not milk, but dairy products um, when they're organic, they actually might have um, a little bit more of those omega threes. Um, so if you can, organic, I think is good. Pasture is probably better. You don't want to have an egg that has been fed, what, corn? or something that, you know, might be a bit more inflammatory. Um, so yeah, something that is healthier, I think will be fine. And if you have a neighbor that grows, you know, that has chickens and can give you eggs, that I think would be the best. Yeah, the happier, yeah. happier chickens, right? <laughs> For sure. Um, somebody asked about the skim milk that's served in schools. Is that impacting childhood obesity? You know, I don't know. There's a lot of data on milk and I, you know, I'm just reviewing these, um, a write-up for the University of Arizona and you want to design a review is milk. And there are so many studies on milk. You can go dizzy with those. Um, I do think that milk as opposed to cheese or yogurt is probably more inflammatory. Um, and that's because milk is homogenized. And when you homogenize it, you're actually allowing to absorb those particles a little bit easier than you have yogurt or cheese. And again, yogurt and cheese also can be fermented, which also give you an extra layer of benefit. So I think milk by itself, I don't think is good. You know, skin better than, you know, full fat. I think the jury is still out there. I would say milk wouldn't be probably my first choice for the drink for the kid, even when it has calcium. Okay. So I think that that's, you know, one of the things that we ask people to look at is what you're drinking, right? So mm -hmm. So, you know, water, teas, black coffee is usually better yep. than, than other beverages. Yep. Um, does enameled cookware work? Yeah, there's also a lot about that too. I mean, um, it, 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 might, it might work for, definitely if you're not scratched, it will work better. Um, there is, 
there is some concern about it. I'm just going to say that. I cannot tell you for sure that it's bad, but there's some concern with the enamel. I think that um, one, uh, somebody on the chat was saying that uh, cast iron skillets are probably the best way to go. And I say, that's true. I think that's a good way to go unless you have, um, yeah, I think cast iron skillet will work really well. Uh, maybe stainless will be another option um, if you wish, but you know, and there's not a lot of iron you get through some people who are concerned about getting iron from those cast iron skillets. At some point, they get a bit of a patina as well, and you don't get the iron from them. So it's not, um, you're not going to get a ton of iron from them. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we talk about is a home cooked meal, no matter really what mm -hmm. you're cooking it in is going to mm -hmm. be better than anything that you get. Absolutely. Yeah, out. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then you did discuss briefly about the method of washing your vegetables and you said, yeah. so, so I think you covered that. Are yeah. home canned food as problematic as the cans you get in stores? And I'm, when I'm thinking about canning, um, Stephanie, I don't know if you were meaning, you know, when you jar food. Um, yeah, no, jar is not. Is the, right. is the can that has, so there's another one, another uh, question about those BPA or BP-like substances. So that's what I send people to the environmental working group because you'll get the ones that have no BP, nothing. So they're no BP. They have um, a sealant that is not uh, BP friend. I mean, I'm friendly, I guess. Um, but no, if you put it in glass, you're good. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, glass is certainly I'm, I'm with you. That will be fine. And um, the BPA free, I think is good, but I think you have to go like a, um, a step beyond and really make sure there's no BPS or BPF in them as well. Yeah, that's, um, so we actually had um, Dr. Ailey Cohen's talk uh, about two weeks ago. No, it was, I thought it was the other way around. I'm, happy, I'm happy me. to share that with uh, one, yeah. I'm just waiting for the, the edited uh, video, but she said it's really hard to get around that. Um, and that's when you have to make that, that nutritional harm reduction choice of are yeah. you, you're going to add beans to your diet and you want them on the table quickly right um, and, and i think you know it, i think it's important to everything else that we're doing so again adding those vegetables and those fruits has been shown to be beneficial and to take away some of the detrimental effects of uh these endocrine disrupting chemicals if you can use organic that also has give you actually um an extra um support to detoxify if you wish right yeah, um, somebody asked about sugar cravings and you know herbalists will talk about bitters and sour foods um interestingly enough there are bitter receptors in our brain that are bitter receptors in the um, intestine and that are bitter receptors in the pancreas so when you eat something bitter um so you start your meal with a bit of radicchio or you um you know a little bit you just munch on it um, or you have a bit of hibiscus without the sugar, um, which is sour, uh, with a bit of lemon, that actually starts to change your palate and also probably those receptors that decrease sugar cravings. Um, it, is, it is insulin resistance that causes sugar cravings. So insulin makes you want to eat more sugar. So it's everything that you can do to lower that insulin resistance is what's going to help also with the sugar cravings. Okay. And I will also put in the chat the um, talk that you did on, on just nighttime cravings. Um, mm -hmm. Please discuss the optimal timing between meals for a person who does not have metabolic syndrome or diabetes, limiting, limiting, limit snacking in favor of about a four hour time window in between meals to avoid the constant secretion of insulin that comes with a lot of snacking in between meals or an eating pattern you know, that's recommended is to eat 400 calories at four hour, hour intervals and include protein, fiber, and fat at each meal. Um, I don't think we know. I'm going to say that. I think that, you know, do we know that eating, like some people have said, you eat small meals for the day, it's better than eating like, you know, three larger meals. I think there's something in terms of gut metabolism that is good to have to allow those waves of the, of the, um, you know, the, the motion of the intestine to really finish its job before you put the next morsel of food in your, in your, in your belly. Um, I, I wish I could tell you, um, I don't think that we know what's optimal. It might be that there's something optimal for you. Um, that is not for others. The idea with the intermittent fasting, um, 
is that, or it's time restricted feeding, is that if you don't eat for a certain amount of time, you're gonna pull um, fat storage from your liver or other you know places where it's been stored around your pancreas, around your belly. So is there something like that that could happen if you don't eat for four hours? And you know, I think there's there's a good possibility that that that's true. Um, but I don't think that we really know um, what whether you you know eat every four hours and you are, have less insulin resistance than if you eat uh, a smaller meal throughout the day. Um, see. Um, is there an issue with silicone coverings of parchment paper when used at high temperatures? I've never looked into that. I've looked into silicone for, um, you know, like for spatulas and things like that. And I really couldn't come up with any answer. I, I didn't, I, I did quite a bit of research on it because it really sort of worried me, but I couldn't really tell. I think that all I could come up is like, yeah, if it's broken, you know, it's going to release some of the, the, the rubber that is underneath, not with the paper. That wouldn't be an issue with your question. Um, but I don't know the answer. I, I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't. Yeah, because we're seeing all these silicone mm -hmm. um, storage containers now, right? Right. So, right. Um, but again, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we just hear over and over is, um, is when you're preparing your food yourself at home, you just really have so much more control over the toxins that, yeah. that are, are being created. And then yeah. the other question that I had, oh, was, um, th there's always a question about fats, right? Um, different mm -hmm. fats, can canola oil, the, you know, on the nice and naughty list. And what I've been hearing is it's also when you're cooking at home mm -hmm. and if that's the oil that you have and that's the oil that you can afford, it's better than not, you know, what, what happens in, you know, prepared, in restaurants and other prepared food places, you just don't know what they're doing with the oils. Which and I think it's, it's really, if you if you had not seen that article in the Washington Post, I think it's really interesting because they really, um, they give you a nice uh, graph and um, almost like a little video, a vignette of how these processed foods are made and, you know, how many steps they go through and what they do with them. And you're like, well, I don't think I'm ever going to put one of those in my mouth if I ever did. It's um, not food. It's it, not food anymore. You know, they, that um, dry heating is really what actually ends up causing a lot of the inflammation in those um, processed foods, not just, you know, in, in addition to the chemicals that they might have. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, it's incredible, the, the amount of frying and that they go through to just make one of those little morsels. So yeah, cooking at your home. And if you keep adding oil, so like if you're cooking with oil and you add a little bit more oil as you're cooking, you're actually going to get sort of fresh oil. So it doesn't get that um, um, uh, sort of old um, or oxidative um, capacity if you keep adding a little bit of oil as you're cooking. It's another little trick. Okay. All right. Well, I think that we are through all of our questions and I want to thank everybody for sharing your time with us tonight and Dr. Benito for sharing your time and your wisdom and knowledge. Um, as I said, I always learn something new and something that we can share. Um, in about a week and a half or so, I will have the recording of this and I'll be sharing it with everybody um, as well as, as some other links to some videos, some other presentations that we've had. Um, please look for, to the future for other programming that we're going to be delivering. And um, if, you, uh, if there's any opportunities for us to come present in other organizations, we are always happy to deliver our programs. And if you found value in this and you'd like to thank us with a donation, we also um, appreciate that as well. We are a nonprofit. And, um, but thank you for being here tonight. And Dr. Benito, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good Happy night. Cooking. <laughs>